On Newsline, the experts who say the world has got it wrong about AIDS. Some doctors say it's not a sexually transmitted disease and HIV may not cause AIDS. We certainly weren't right. That is obvious from the results that we have gotten. We haven't saved one life, we haven't come up with a vaccine, we haven't achieved anything with the virus hypothesis. Uh, in my view, HIV may have a role in AIDS, but there are a sufficient number of cases of people who have been diagnosed with AIDS without HIV to make me question whether it's even necessary. And the young mother trying to get back her son abducted by her husband. Hello and welcome to Newsline. For years, millions of pounds has been poured into AIDS research, but a small number of eminent doctors are claiming that we may have got it all wrong. One expert has even gone as far as claiming that AIDS isn't a sexually transmitted disease. The dissident medical professionals met in Amsterdam for a conference that's bound to annoy the majority of AIDS researchers. They claim that the HIV virus doesn't necessarily lead to AIDS and that the AIDS establishment has been going down the wrong path looking for a cure. Among those challenging the orthodox view is the French virologist Luc Montagnier, the man who first discovered HIV back in 1983. In a minute, we'll hear from an AIDS researcher who thinks the dissidents are wrong. But first, Joan Shenton reports from Amsterdam. It's now eight years since HIV was announced as the probable cause of AIDS. This summer, thousands of people will be gathering here in Amsterdam for the World AIDS Conference in July to discuss the latest research into the virus. But today, a very special group of scientists, a dissident group, is meeting to question the role of HIV in AIDS. Have we been wrong all this time? We certainly weren't right. That is obvious from the results that we have gotten. We haven't saved one life, we haven't come up with a vaccine, we haven't achieved anything with the virus hypothesis. Uh, in my view, HIV may have a role in AIDS, but there are a sufficient number of cases of people who have been diagnosed with AIDS without HIV to make me question whether it's even necessary. The HIV paradigm has produced nothing of value for my life, and I actually believe that treatments based on the arrogant belief that HIV has been proven to be the sole and sufficient cause of AIDS has hastened the deaths of many of my friends. This international symposium called AIDS A Different View was held in an old Amsterdam church. 200 scientists, health workers and people with AIDS met to discuss differing views on the cause of AIDS. Professor Luc Montagnier first discovered the HIV retrovirus. Does he still believe that HIV is the prime factor in the cause of AIDS? Certainly. I would say uh, rather simply that uh, without HIV, there won't be any AIDS epidemic right now. HIV is the transmissible agent of the disease. There is, I don't think there is a doubt for that. But Luc Montagnier believes HIV needs cofactors in order to cause AIDS. And he admits there are many unanswered questions. For example, people can have HIV and not progress to AIDS. We are seeing people which have been infected for 9, 10 years or more, or more 10, 12 years, and they are still in good shape. Their immune system is still good. And it's in, it is unlikely those people will come down, will come down with AIDS uh, later. Although at least 90% of people who get AIDS in the West are from health risk groups, like some homosexual men and intravenous drug users, health authorities have chosen to concentrate not on the dangers of the drugs themselves, focusing instead on clean needle campaigns and warnings that the whole population is at risk because AIDS is a sexually transmitted disease. This theory was strongly challenged by Peter Duisberg. Is AIDS a sexually transmitted disease? I, absolutely not. There's no evidence for that at all. If it were, we would see AIDS in teenagers, we would see it in women, we would see it in heterosexual males, and none of this is happening in the Western world. 
In the UK, the spread of AIDS through heterosexual sex in non-risk groups is virtually non-existent. The latest published figures show 54 reported cases in 10 years. It was thought that prostitutes represented a particularly high risk group for the transmission of HIV and AIDS. But recent research shows that yet another hypothesis has been wrong. There have been dozens of studies worldwide on whether female prostitutes develop either HIV or AIDS. And every single one of those studies in Europe and the United States has shown definitively that female prostitutes who do get HIV or who do, do develop AIDS are almost without exception, there are a few exceptions, but almost without exception, intravenous drug abusers. If they don't use drugs, they don't get HIV and they don't get AIDS, and they're seeing the same clientele. Doubts about the role of HIV in AIDS spring from the fact that so few cells are found to be infected by HIV in AIDS patients. HIV cannot be the cause of AIDS because it doesn't infect enough cells and isn't active enough. It's only found in one out of 8,000 T cells, which are often not always lost in AIDS, and they can't be, that loss can't be due to HIV if only one in 8,000 cells are infected. So, if HIV can't cause AIDS, what can? Peter Duisberg believes AIDS related diseases result from certain medical conditions and the toxic effects of recreational and intravenous drugs. The only thing that's new in America, in fact, in the Western world, in terms of health threats is the dramatically escalating consumption of recreational drugs, which started after the Vietnam War and has increased over 100-fold in the last 10 years alone in the United States. It is a behavioral disease. It's not a contagious disease. It is a disease that is linked to drug abusers, intravenous drug users, or oral drug users, and clinical health risk groups, like recipients of transfusions and hemophiliacs. It never spreads into the general population. That is a hallmark of a behavioral disease, a disease caused by drugs or toxins associated with that behavior, not an infectious disease which spreads randomly in the, in the uh, general population. Michael Callan has been HIV positive for nine years and is a long-term survivor of AIDS. He believes that many different factors can cause AIDS and describes how his doctor in New York, Joe Sonnabend, helped him. I didn't want to look at my lifestyle, but when I read Dr. Sonnabend's really well-written, well-thought-out, what he did was he strung together a theory about what the cumulative consequences of an abusive lifestyle might be. And I recognized myself in the portrait that he presented. And it suddenly occurred to me the fact that by the age of 26 I'd had hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis non A, non B, herpes simplex 1 and 2, Shigella, endemia, histolytica, giardia, syphilis, gonorrhea, nonspecific urethritis, venereal warts, CMV, EBV, and eventually cryptosporidium and AIDS. I simply no longer, once somebody articulated the perspective that the cumul cumulative effect of that might be disastrous for my body. It became impossible for me to pretend that that disease history was irrelevant to the fact that I was sick. It was sort of emotionally attractive to believe that it had nothing to do with any choices I'd made, that it was just bad luck, I'd accidentally slept with the wrong person. But once I was presented with a non-moralistic, calm, medical, rational presentation of a multifactorial mechanism which might account for my illness, I was never quite able to believe again that, that a disease of this complexity was ever going to have a single simple cause. The single simple cause approach has led to very specific drug therapies with antiviral drugs like the controversial AZT or Zidovudine, manufactured by the Wellcome Foundation. 180,000 World War now are prescribed ACT, a chain terminator of DNA synthesis, the most direct uh, drug causing AIDS. ACT is simply AIDS by prescription. Recreational drugs 
are harder to uh, convert into AIDS. That's what we call the long latent period. You have to inject cocaine on average 10 years to get sick, but AZT, it's enough for a couple of weeks or months. Sometimes it takes a year before enough of the bone marrow is killed that you are a pronounced an AIDS patient from leukopenia, anemia, muscle atrophy, and, and serious nausea and weight loss because you can't t pick up food anymore because your, your guts are intoxicated with AZT. Luke Montagne disagrees with Peter Duisberg about the toxicity of the drug. Uh, AZT so far has proven to be the best drug to inhibit. There are some others now which are also in trial, but AZT was the first. So what I will do, or I will recommend is to the patient, is to, to stay on AZT treatment because there is nothing better now. In the warm Amsterdam sunshine, the three-day conference generated some heated debate. By the end, the overall feeling was one of anger that scientific research should have locked itself in for so long to the single theory that HIV is the cause of AIDS. I have the sinking feeling that I'm going to die as a result of the dilly-dallying. Uh, the anger comes when I then think about the people who are dying because this isn't, is not a, a question of simply pushing through the research to convince other scientists. This is a question that every month that goes by, we have several hundreds or thousands of people who died who might have been able to be helped if only we'd gotten the research done earlier or convinced more people to move in this direction. I would argue at a minimum that the absolute bankruptcy of antiretroviral therapy argues at a minimum that it's time to reopen the question and to start exploring other treatment strategies that are based on equally plausible models of disease causation. Meditel's Joan Shenton reporting on the doctors who think the current thinking on AIDS is wrong. Well, is it? Joining me here in the studio is Professor Angus Dalgleish, who researches AIDS at St. George's Hospital in South London. Professor Dalgleish, um, I think the point that initially came out in that film is that um, Professor Duisberg is saying that medical research aimed at the AIDS virus is misguided and in fact hasn't saved a single life. Well, I think that's clearly ridiculous because uh, many, many lives have been saved, really hundreds of thousands, because of the, uh, first of all, the control of the blood transfusion, the factor eights of the haemophiliacs. I mean, we know that this was transmitting AIDS and since that uh, we've identified the virus, uh, identified which um, samples have got the virus in, excluded those, there's been no transmission from uh, the blood banks at all. So that's an inordinate number of lives. And the same thing goes with the heterosexual spread, that uh, you know, people who have taken precautions almost certainly have saved lives uh, in passing the virus on who know that they've been infected. Of course, there's this incredible allegation as well, is that, that the AIDS is not a sexually transmitted disease. I mean, that's a, that's a thing that most people would find incredibly difficult to take on board, isn't it? I think anybody, I, I can't understand that whether Duisburg's ever been to Africa, but in Africa it, it, it behaves just like a sexually transmitted disease. When we first uh, had attention drawn to this slim disease in Africa, which is basically a, a wasting, and we did a lot of research in, the, uh, in about 1985, the thing that staggered me, I did not expect this disease to be heterosexually transmitted, but it was a one-to-one. -one. There was just as many women infected as there were men, and you could take index cases and find they traveled to a village for two or three days, slept with these two or three people, then they would be ill, and you could trace the, the infection flowing from one to the other, from one village to another. And we now know that uh, in those days there was, there was little infection in Uganda. We now know in many of the hospitals over half the people are infected and they're coming down ill at the rate you would expect. Does he not have a point, though, that HIV does not necessarily become full-blown AIDS? Well, that, that's important, too. And we made this point very early on in the uh, early epidemiology. It was only a very small percentage of people would appear to be getting ill at that time. And then as the, the disease progressed, I mean, the, the, the epidemic progressed through uh, sort of 86, 87, it transpired that the majority of people, when we could identify who had the virus on board and who didn't, and we could follow them for a few years, the majority right. of people were getting ill. So it was revised. And then some, I think, were fairly... Uh, bold, bold accusations were made that everybody who's got the virus is going to get ill and I mean there's very few uh, viral infections where uh, you, you can be sure everybody who contracts is going to uh, 
to, to manifest all the symptoms. We know that from all the Cardinal Garden viruses. And then it was clear that there were some people who we could track back sort of way before we knew about AIDS, as it were. We could see their blood was infected for 10 years, that they were quite well 10 years later, that there was a small mm. percentage of people who don't seem to be getting ill. Uh, now, before we go to uh, Professor Duisberg, who, who's in Berlin at the moment, um, would you say, theref therefore, that um, Professor Duisberg was was misguided. I mean, he undoubtedly has a fairly firm academic track record. Um, you're not suggesting that he's unethical or anything like that. Are you suggesting that he's dangerous? I'm suggesting that, I mean, that everyone in the field appreciates what Professor Duesberg did for the molecular biology, but I think what he's doing for this field is saying that the AIDS isn't caused by uh, the, the HIV virus, when it, it clearly is. And the, the data, anybody who wants to look for it, went to a court jury, there was just absolutely no doubt at all that the virus causes the disease. He has mentioned several points about it. If we could only get away from the fact that he says the virus doesn't cause the disease, he has mentioned several points which are of great interest and on, uh, Professor Montagne has picked up on them. We're not quite sure how the virus is causing the disease and what else is required to make it occur quickly in certain people and why D some people don't get it so quickly. Would you say, though, in a word, d does that present a danger to the public? I think it presents a tremendous danger if people are going to get a message out there that the virus doesn't cause AIDS and it's due to something else. And if they're not intravenous drug abusers, then they're absolutely at no risk. Let's go now to Professor Peter Duisberg, who's in Berlin. Professor Duisberg, we've got Professor Dalglish here saying that you actually do present a, a danger to people. Yes, that's what he feels and that's what many feel. Well, I think I could return the compliment, unfortunately. I think the orthodoxy is the danger to the people. The orthodoxy hasn't saved one life with the virus hypothesis, hasn't provided a vaccine, hasn't provided a drug, has not even predicted how AIDS is going to spread, that it would not spread into the heterosexual population exactly as they had predicted that they couldn't come up with a vaccine. So, in fact, what's even worse than that, they have come up with a so-called antiviral drug, AZT, which is known to be extremely toxic. It is by far the most toxic drug that has ever been approved for long-term consumption in anybody in the Western world. It was initially developed solely to kill human cells for, well, chemo for chemotherapy and is now used as an antiviral pro drug. Yes. Professor Giesler, let, let's just move away from AZT just for one moment yeah. and concentrate on, for example, the introduction of screening, the introduction of uh, massive campaigns for safe sex. Are you saying that that sort of procedure has not saved a single life? There is no evidence that the safe sex campaign has saved one single life. It continues to increase despite the safe sex campaigns. You could, of course, make a hypothesis and say it would have increased even further, but there is no evidence for that, none whatsoever. Heterosexuals do not get AIDS. Prostitutes do not get AIDS, at least not in, nobody in the Western world, that is in the U.S. and in uh, Europe. Okay, Professor Duisberg, thank you very much for joining us. What would you say to that? Professor Duisberg, they're merely reiterating the, the message we heard in that film. It, it totally reiterates and says that continually, he keeps saying there's no evidence. There is absolutely litany of evidence. He either uh, can't read it or he can't understand it when he sees it. And I really have to be that blunt about it. I mean, it is, you cannot say that and uh, expect to get away with it. Professor Douglas, thank you very much for joining us. Well, that's where we'll take a break. In a moment, the young mother trying to get back her son from the father who snatched him.